They call it the holy grail of artificial intelligence. The sky is the limit, what we can uh, use that for. Building a computer that can do everything we can, or even more. Some believe that could help cure all types of cancer, eradicate poverty, and create a more equal society. But others warn that such a system could turn against us and become a threat to our very existence. So where does work on artificial general intelligence stand? And is it a good idea to go down that path? From DW, this is Techtopia. And in this episode, we're taking a deep dive into the world of AI and what to do if super intelligent machines at some point become smarter than we are. We meet a researcher on the quest for human level AI. We explain how scientists are trying to teach computers how to think, and we have a glimpse of the questions awaiting us. So how can we ensure that we don't end up abusing digital minds? But if you think getting there will be easy, well, think again. There's no golden algorithm for our mind. This is my elementary school, and my last year here, when I was 12, was in 1976. So I haven't been back here since. It looks almost like it was uh, just preserved in amber. My name is Kristin R. Thorson, uh, or Chris Thorson, and I am uh, an AI researcher. I was born in Reykjavik in Iceland and uh, raised there for most of my life. It was here that Chris decided over 45 years ago what he wanted to do in life. My parents had bought some books on science and computers at the time were really talked about as brains. That they would get bigger and more complex and it, it really caught my imagination. It was a few years later, I was on the bus riding back from, from school and this thought struck me. You know, if, if all of the processes in a human brain are physical processes, then why shouldn't we be able to copy them? My friends, the family, they didn't really get it. They, some of them thought I was pretty crazy. I really had no mentors. Finding someone in Iceland with an interest in artificial intelligence was completely uh, hopeless. So Chris taught himself how to code, and he read every book on AI he could get his hands on. I did stumble on articles written by people like Marvin Minsky that became my heroes. Across the Atlantic, computer scientist Minsky had made waves with a theory on how the human mind could be replicated in a machine. Finally, I found voices that were saying the things I was thinking. And at some point, Chris knew what he had to do. That was over four decades ago, so how much closer have we come to building such a computer? We'll get to that. But first, let's look at what people mean when they say artificial intelligence. Whenever computers do tasks that would otherwise require human thinking, people today speak of artificial intelligence. And it's already everywhere around us. AI is used to filter emails for spam, help your smartphone understand your voice, or scan x-rays for cancer. But the systems are only good at those very specific tasks, unlike us humans who excel in many areas. Human radiologists don't just spot cancer. They also understand language, they can tell if an email is spam, and they can also learn how to ride a bike, play the violin, write a book, the list goes on. Creating a computer system that can learn and perform the same huge range of things, that's the goal behind Artificial General Intelligence, or AGI. Uh, in 1988, uh, I moved to the US, and in 1990, I, uh, I went to MIT and ended up there in, uh, in the Media Lab. I was uh, sitting in, in class with Marvin Minsky, and I had to pinch myself. Chris got his PhD, worked for big companies, and founded his own startup. But as his knowledge grew over the years, so did his doubts that this work would get him closer to his big goal. I already knew I wanted to do real AI, not fake AI. A machine that, that really understands, a machine that, that really thinks. And when his homesick wife convinced him in the early 2000s to move back to Iceland, he was granted another chance. 
Reykjavik University had recently been founded and they had decided to become a, a, a research university and were looking for faculty, so I decided to give it a shot. Chris isn't the first scientist who's after building a machine with human-level intelligence. When we looked into history, we realized that the idea has fascinated thinkers for millennia. In Greek mythology, dating back about 2,500 years, there's the story of how the god of technology creates an artificial giant to protect the island of Crete. Ancient Chinese literature from around the same time includes the tale of an inventor who builds a mechanical man. Ever since, the idea has inspired storytellers. Also, scientists have tried for centuries to invent intelligent machines. But it wasn't until the mid-20th century that the rise of computers gave the field such a push that during a workshop in 1956, researchers coined the term artificial intelligence. And just a few years later, Nobel Prize winner Herbert A. Simon predicted that machines will be capable within 20 years of doing any work that a man can do. It's very typical to be optimistic and uh, over-promise and under-deliver. And uh, for the first 30 years of AI, I think the prediction was that we would have a generally intelligent machine within 10 years. And every year it was pushed back one year. So it was always 10 years away. People um, get very optimistic because they, they want to solve this puzzle. You see this again and again, this, this kind of uh, optimism coming back in waves and um, a gross underestimation of the difficulty of the challenge. That's why the history of AI is a story of ups and downs, of unlikely discoveries and big promises, followed by inevitable retreats and AI winters when the attention and funding dried out. It's the nature of science to work in spirals, to always have tentative theories, to try them out, to see what works, what doesn't work. And we have had tremendous successes. AI has helped computers beat humans in the game show Jeopardy, win against them in sophisticated board games, and solve challenges scientists have been trying to crack for decades. These are significant breakthroughs. And for the first time in history, AI technology is now part of the devices we use every day. Your smartphone, for example, uses AI to sort your photos or to predict what you're going to type. This has made the field, which was long considered little more than blue sky research, interesting for the industry. And it has led to an explosion in global investment. But how much does this narrow AI of today have to do with the human-level general intelligence that scientists like Chris Thorison are after. Most of today's AI systems learn by analyzing masses of data for patterns. That makes them good at making predictions, such as guessing which cells in an X-ray could soon grow into cancer. But they understand little about why things happen, and they lack a very human faculty, common sense, which takes many years to develop. Children need about two years to understand that, although various types of chairs look different, they can all be sat on. By the age of four, kids can draw detailed pictures based on their imagination, and once they're seven to eight years old, they understand the difference between reality and fiction. But kids don't analyze data to learn those skills. Instead, they observe their environment and learn from the consequences. Experts say that for computers to achieve general intelligence, they need to start learning more like kids do. This could allow them one day to do the things we can, but which are still out of reach today. To imagine entirely new things, for example. It's written in my first notebook that I, on the first month that I joined Reykjavik University, can we make a machine that, that has imagination? with all sorts of other capabilities that humans also have. Uh, for instance, making analogies, comparing and contrasting, coming up with arguments, coming up with silly arguments, the whole wide spectrum. A simple analogy uh, like, what's the similarity between water and sand? Um, most seven-year-olds and up can 
can answer that question. What is the similarity between water and sand, for example? Well, uh, instead of me telling you that, uh, think about what is my mind doing when I try to answer a question like, what's the similarity between water and sand? And that's something computers can't do. No, they can't. During his first years at the university, Chris developed a theory for such a system he called ERA. And in the late 2000s, he got enough funding to hire programmers and code a demonstration. So in this scene, uh, essentially, a human is interviewing the AI. Now, on the left-hand side, you have an avatar that's controlled entirely by our AI. The human is essentially asking the AI what this object is. This cardboard box is made from natural wood fibers. And this is something the AI has learned. We did not teach the AI anything about language or how to create sentences. We told the AI that the goal of an interview is to get the interviewee to, to speak and to talk about things. And that the goal of an interviewer is to get the interviewee to speak. And uh, that this particular interview is about the objects on the table. Then we had it watch two people doing an interview. Within 20 hours of observing, the system taught itself how to pick up objects or how to talk about them. We didn't tell the AI that, that nodding has meaning, but it learned that actually when the interviewer nods, uh, it means that the interviewer is pleased and wants, wants you to go on. These results exceeded Chris' expectations, and eventually his team showed their demo to the public. We thought, well, now Getting more funding should be uh, trivial, but no. It's a lot harder to, to convince people than I thought. So is this the end to the Icelandic quest for artificial intelligence? We'll get to that. But first, let's pause here for a second to do a thought experiment. Let's assume that scientists like Chris at some point succeed in creating a computer system as smart as, say, Albert Einstein, Marie Curie, or Leonardo da Vinci. Then what? Couldn't it be that such a machine creates even more intelligent machines, which at some point become so sophisticated, we simply cannot understand them anymore? It seems somewhat likely, perhaps, that there will be an intelligence explosion at some point. Perhaps you could go from something that is roughly comparable to a human to something that is radically super intelligent. Which brings us to the concept of super intelligence an idea that fuels the imagination of thinkers and which was made famous by this philosopher. So if you get some computer that just totally leaves us in the dust in terms of its ability to learn science, to uh, in invent new things, to write novels, to carry conversations, to have common sense and wisdom, uh, then that would be a super intelligence. Some say that such a system could become our most loyal companion and free us of the burden of work. But others warn that only a tiny, powerful elite could end up benefiting from the technology. And they say that once such a system becomes smarter than we are, it could turn against its inferior creators, us. Now, think of the first images you have of such a superhuman artificial intelligence. If images like that popped up in your mind, you're not alone. There are essentially two sources where people get their information about AI from, and those are the news media and fiction. And especially when the news media and fiction start working together and using the same images over and over and over, using Terminator images over and over and over, that really shapes people's idea of artificial intelligence. OK, so let's set the record straight. If it's not the Terminator, then what would such a system look like? Not very interesting. It would basically look like a, um, a big server room with a lot of racks. The real action lies in the brain of this thing. And if you have a super intelligent brain, it could have a huge impact on the world, even if it had no hands or fingers or face. Like if all it could do was to produce text on a screen. And, and communicate to some human gatekeeper, that would already be enough. In the right hands, such a system could help solve some of our greatest problems, from the climate crisis to deadly diseases. But honestly, how does the idea of such an artificial system, which can do all the things we can do, and potentially even more, make you feel? 
I think it's natural to be afraid of the unknown and these kinds of machines have certainly never existed, but the kinds of details that people worry about are completely unwarranted at this stage. It will take many years and, and decades to figure out all of the pieces of the puzzle. How can we make sure that the values of those AI systems are aligned with what we have defined as fundamental human rights? Well, we have laws in the society that uh, prevent people from doing things that we think are undesirable, and we have mechanisms for ensuring those laws. Uh, we can even engineer them, possibly, uh, into the machines to some extent. But how do you do that? How do you code values like fairness or equality into an intelligent machine? A machine that, just like us, keeps learning and evolving. It is still an open research question in general how you do this. Um, there are various ideas. Uh, it, it looks, for example, that rather than trying to code in from advance some hard rules that define exactly what we want, what you instead might want to do is to have a system that can learn about uh, human values uh, in the same way as it learns about everything else. And there's another question that has so far received little attention. Let's assume that those machines indeed become smarter and smarter. Could they at some point also develop emotions or feel pain? And if so, should we consider them digital minds in their own right? And do we need rules to make sure we don't oppress them? These AIs, I think, will you know, become increasingly comparable maybe to even initially smaller animals like, like mice and cats and dogs and you know, eventually maybe human-like or, or, or uh, super intelligent. And I think at that point, some of these systems will have moral status. I mean, we're already struggling to treat animals the way we should. And, and so getting our empathy to extend into a, a box that doesn't have eyes that can't squeak, but where there is some maybe sentient process running deep inside a processor is going to be a big challenge for human morality. I don't think that emotions or consciousness will just appear out of nowhere. I think it's a, those are very complex phenomena. And frankly, we don't know enough about them to have any idea of really uh, what, what are necessary and sufficient conditions for, uh, f for making them happen. But wouldn't now be the right time to think about that before it becomes a reality? I think the best way to answer some of these questions is, is actually to do this research, because um, without this research, we will never have enough evidence to say whether one kind of machine is very likely to feel pain. And when it says it feels pain, it's actually not lying. And finally, this isn't only about the relationship between AI and us. It could also have consequences for how we as humans treat each other. What I'm concerned about is that some humans will be considered less human than this artificial intelligence, less deserving of rights, less deserving of proper treatment, because that is a trend that you're already starting to see, that for example, decisions made by some artificial intelligence systems are considered more valued, more truthful. That's why the experts we talked to agreed that rules are needed for a time at which we might coexist with human-level artificial intelligence. We have to ask ourselves firstly, do we want to live in a world where humans share their world with entities that are not human, but that can reason better than they can and that can reinvent themselves faster than humans can. And then we have to ask who will decide. It should be a global conversation because this is about humanity as a whole. But how much time do we have to write the rules for such an era? How far are we from reaching artificial general intelligence? 40 to 60 years. I'm not keen to do predictions about that. They're just extremely likely to be wrong. It could happen surprisingly soon. I mean, there could be somebody making some breakthrough a few years from now and suddenly it all takes off. One of the main reasons why I chose to dedicate my professional life to AI is because I thought that I would be able to see some amazing things in my lifetime. At the top of that list is uh, realizing general machine intelligence. And I absolutely don't think that is impossible, but 
um, it's going more slowly than I thought. After Chris showed the first demonstration of his ERA system over a decade ago, work mostly came to a standstill because he couldn't find fresh funding. Only recently, American tech company Cisco injected new money into the project. Well, now we're still, again, basically developing the software and, and doing the, the research full, full steam ahead. As a teenager, back in the 1970s, Chris was convinced that by the time he was grown up, scientists would have long solved the puzzle of artificial general intelligence. Now, here we are, uh, several decades later, and uh, it still hasn't really happened. But once again, a new AI summer has sprung. The world's largest tech giants are all investing heavily in the field. And the question is, should that worry us? The reason why big tech fund these kinds of ventures is because the people that own the most of these kinds of development in terms of artificial general intelligence will be very, very, very powerful. Um, and we have to ask ourselves, do we want to give that power to private transnational companies? And do you want them to decide about the future of your son or your daughter? After decades of research, Chris Thorson is convinced it won't be a single breakthrough, but several approaches combined that will help find the holy grail of artificial intelligence. You tend to get uh, graduates who think that they will do this one discovery and then AI will be solved. And that's not the case? That is absolutely not the case. As humanity is inching closer to creating artificial general intelligence, many things remain uncertain. While some doubt that AGI can ever be achieved, others are certain it will. But they disagree over whether that will be a blessing or our demise. The truth is, they could all be right. We simply don't know. But the reality is that in this moment, scientists around the world are working on such technology. Some in the open, many behind closed doors. And there's little doubt that AGI could disrupt society in the coming decades like few inventions before. That's why it's important to have this debate today. Because once we reach human level artificial intelligence, it could be too late. <laughs>